the criminal justice system, the people... Pimps, addicts, thieves, bums, winos, girls who can't keep an address, and men who don't care... ...are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. A cop, a flatfoot, a bull, a dick, John Law, you're the fuzz, the heat, you're poison, you're trouble, you're bad news. These are their stories. Trump's... Lee Lauda grows. A, um... Verdict holding Donald Trump liable for sexual abuse and defamation, injecting maybe a new uncertainty into the 2024 presidential race. This will test whether voters and Republican allies will stick with him through another controversy. You know, E. Jean Carroll sued the former president, accused him of battery over an alleged rape in the 19th, and that of defamation for calling her account a hoax. This is the greatest New York Post cover that we've seen in some time. Grab him by the wallet. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is the front page of the New York Post. Trump owes accuser $5 million after he's found liable for sex abuse and defamation. Asked on the verdict sheet if Carol, 79 had proven by a preponderance of the evidence that, quote, Mr. Trump raped Ms. Carroll, the nine-person jury checked the box that said no. Asked if Carroll had proven by a preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Trump, quote, sexually abused Ms. Carroll. The jury checked the box that said yes. Both allegations were elements of Carroll's battery claim. The six men and three women also found Trump had defamed Carroll by calling her claims a hoax and a con job. The the jury deliberated for only about three hours before returning the verdict. By the way, that's notable. We'll talk to David Katz about this, but that really means that by the time they got to the jury room, there had been enough presented in that case that they were comfortable with a decision in their mind already, I would suggest, right? Two and a half hours. I mean, that's, you know. They awarded Carol just over two million on the battery claim and just under three million on the defamation claims. I filed, this is a quote from Carol. I filed this lawsuit against Donald Trump to clear my name and to get my life back. Today, the world finally knows the truth. She didn't speak to reporters apart from that. In a separate statement, her lawyer, Robert, uh, Roberta Kaplan, I should say, said, no one is above the law, not even a former president of the United States. We are so thrilled that the jury agreed. Uh, Karen Cooper says Trump's lawyer said on CNN that they would appeal on the constitutionality, the constitutionality, apparently his right to defame Carol. She also said he was not guilty of rape. This is the lawyer who said that. Uh, He was convicted of sexual assault. Yeah, well, you expect that. Right. I see your point, Karen. He was convicted of sexual assault, but the lawyer is going to go on and go, see, he was not guilty of rape. I I get it. That's sort of just, you know, Trump defense 101. And don't you think, too, that because the conviction happened in the civil court and not criminal, that they'll be able to say, oh, his job was just a civil case. That had nothing, you know, I'm not a convicted anything. I'm not a convicted abuser. You know, I don't have a record of that. That, that was just a civil. They'll, they'll explain it away. Well, it, they'll try to diminish the verdict in any way they can, and that's Trump's way. And in fact, he went on his Truth Social Network and he said in all caps, I have absolutely no idea who this woman is. This verdict is a disgrace, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. I think we're going to hear witch hunt an awful lot. Mm. And a lot of people in the chat are saying and commenting about how this woman, uh, E. Jean Carroll, will likely never collect a cent of this money. I think she'll have to you know, go through the appeal process and, you know, tracking Trump down and getting money out of him is never easy, even if you have a a verdict. And I think that, um, you know, if history is a guide, there might be some truth to that, but eventually uh, you will be able to collect. So, uh, but they will appeal it. So, you know, it was, um, and again, of all of the cases that face Donald Trump, and I, I do um, want to talk to David Katz about this. It's odd that, again, this one, you know, crossed the finish line first. Maybe because it's a civil case, but, uh, you know, the the case was punctuated by a few key moments. Trump saying he, you know, would never, she's not my type. And we to- told you this the other day, how he confused the pictures. And, you know, you, by now you've seen that entire thing. But I think the 
questions as to politically for Trump, uh, they're legit. You know, what you see from the the jury verdict, and by the way, the only reason that E. Jean Carroll could bring this case even is because the sexual assault survivors, uh, I think it's called the uh, Adult Survivors Act, the New York Adult Survivors Act. Uh, sexual su assault survivors spent years fighting this statute of limitations on bringing a case like E. Jean Carroll's uh, to be extended. And that's the only reason that you actually saw this case in court. She was able to bring the civil suit because of that. You know, so you have sexual assault survivors who are going to begin to see their day in court in a way that they were not able to see it in the past. It took over three years for these survivors to get that law passed. And many years of activists lobbying uh, the New York Child Victims Act, which became law in 2019, you know, these victims of uh, sexual abuse on, you know, with, with kids, all this stuff that's just, you know, it's grotesque. All of these cases of sexual aggression and what I consider sexual violence, uh, there was a statute of limitations on them before, and it, and it was not there. But now, with the extension of that, as I say, that permitted E. Jean Carroll to bring that civil lawsuit against uh, Trump. The MAGA wagons have circled. <laughs> no, it's not a criminal case, right? It's a civil case. That's exactly right, Joe. The MAGA uh, wagons have, uh, I'm seeing, I'm looking at these, uh, jury of his peers, only multimillionaires can sit in judgment or only philandering men. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a jury of his peers, Louise. Yeah. That jury's a joke, says many, uh, say many in MAGA land. GOP senators defend Donald Trump after the sexual battery verdict. Even Republican senators who expressed unease about the verdict wouldn't rule out supporting Trump if he became their presidential nominee. It's the old adage. Democrats fall in love. Republicans fall in line. And they do. Republican lawmakers defended former President Donald Trump after he was found liable for sexual assault and defamation. That jury's a joke. The whole case is a joke, said Senator Marco Rubio. Little Marco is coming to Trump's side. If someone accuses me of raping them and I didn't do it, and you're innocent, of course you're going to say something about it. It was a joke, Rubio added of the defamation findings. Trump, who declined the opportunity to defend himself in court, denied the allegation and called the verdict a disgrace. As I mentioned before, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. By the way, the greatest witch hunt of all time was the Salem witch, witch hunt. So right away, you're in second position. It seems to me the greatest witch hunt of all time was the actual witch hunt, <laughs> Salem witch hunt. Then if you want second position, there's competition. But there's I'm just never saying. been anything like this. Yeah. Uh, but Trump's top allies on Capitol Hill dismissed the verdict, suggesting the jury had found Trump liable and... It wasn't legitimate because it was drawn, that jury, out of a blue state pool. The same defense Republicans trotted out when Republican was criminally charged in Manhattan over hush money payments to an adult film star earlier this year. It makes me want to vote for him twice, said Senator Tommy Tuberville from Alabama. Isn't that illegal? <laughs> <laughs> desperate times require desperate oh. measures. Lulu writes, we witches take offense. Yes. They're going to do anything they can to keep him from winning, said Tuberville. It ain't going to work. People are going to see through the lines. A New York jury, he had no chance. Senator Rick Scott from Florida said, he said he didn't do it. Asked if he could support someone found liable for sexual battery, the senator said, I don't know the facts, and it's a New York jury. This New York jury thing, I told you, that's their thing, right? They they get their talking points, and they hit them, and they keep hitting them. Lindsey Graham, when it comes to Donald Trump, the New York legal system is off the rails, he said. Uh, you never like to hear a former president has been found guilty in civil court of those types of actions, said Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota. 
But when asked if he could support someone found liable of battery, Round said, I would have a difficult time doing so. So Joe that says, how many people say they did it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. Everybody denies it. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good point. So that's one part of law and disorder. The Trump part, the MAGA wagon circled what they're saying. Essentially, they're attacking the jury. Federal prosecutors have filed criminal charges against New York Congressperson George Santos, the Republican lawmaker whose astonishing pattern of lies and fabrications stunned even hardened politicos, is expected to appear. I think he was, um, he was, he was, as they say, he surrendered to authorities. Isn't that what they say, Kim? Um, and now we know a little something about what he was charged with. Isn't that right, Kim? Uh, we do know a little something about what he was charged with. As a matter of fact, uh, that is a hell of a lot of charges. What did they say? A 13-count indictment mm. is what it is. So, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not sorry. Uh, 13 federal charges, including counts of wire fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and lying to the U.S. House. Well, lying? Are we surprised by that one? Yeah. Uh, in addition, among these, you know, when you look deeper into it, I was uh, reading a story on CNN that was talking about how prosecutors are saying that Santos used campaign funds for personal expenses, such as designer clothes. Uh, he also apparently, allegedly, was on, uh, was taking COVID unemployment benefits at the same time that he was calling on the president to end said benefits and voting <laughs> against said benefits in the house. So, well, what? We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that. Well, there's a lot of that. You find it everywhere, right? When you oppose the infrastructure bill and then as a GOP Senator, you come out and go, I want to, you know, celebrate the rebuilding of this bridge. We've waited for 30 years to rebuild this bridge. And it's like, dude, you voted against rebuilding the bridge. You voted against, right. you know, getting the money to rebuild the bridge. So, you know, success has many fathers. Failure dies an orphan. Uh, there you go. The success of the, uh, um, uh, that, that it, 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 the success of the, of the program that, you know, feathers your nest, in this case, George Santos, that comes out of the COVID relief package, uh, you know, you have no problem taking the money, but you got a problem you know, right. when it comes to, right, your is public position on it. Is that hypocrisy or irony? Fire liar, oh. your pants <laughs> are on fire! I'm going to say it is, um, it's definitely hypocrisy. It might have, it might be, yeah, it might be because irony it, also. The rare the technical definition of both. Yeah, the rare twin towers of uh, <laughs> irony and hypocrisy. Well done, Kim. Well That's done. That's almost like the rod of equity and mercy. Yes, huh? I, I, really. That was very, very good. Yeah. Um, now, let me just quickly uh, uh, round out the political implications and the legislative implications. As I promised I would. Uh, the federal charges come, of course, after you know this guy Santos has you know been leading the parade of liars. Uh, he uh, won that swing district in New York, uh, sworn in in January, but exposed as a serial liar. He fabricated his work history, his education. He fabricated uh, all sorts of things related to finance. Um, there were new lies being revealed, and I discussed at some length why we didn't know about these things in the mainstream media, um, because of these congressional races involve such a small number of uh, people, that is to say, districts that don't drive a lot of media frankly there's just not a lot of local media covering specific district races and that's the way reason really that uh we didn't hear about it in the mainstream media but there was reporting on this before he was elected it just didn't ever make it into the mainstream with enough momentum to affect the outcome anyway santos falsely claimed to be the jewish descendant of refugees from the holocaust <laughs> then he had the great <laughs> Seinfeldian ex explanation <laughs> saying, well, I didn't say I was Jewish. I said I was Jew-ish. <laughs> I was ish. Yeah. There's, um, a dash. There's a dash yeah. there, okay? It makes a big difference. Yeah. Now, in the short term, Santos's indictment won't change anything. Um, 
you know, he's been pulled off committees, but that is really what happens automatically. So giving up committee assignments after being criminally charged is routine. Um, he already gave up his committee positions in January after he met with uh, Kevin McCarthy. And McCarthy's saying, nothing's going to change. We'll just follow the same pattern we always have, is a quote. If a person is indicted, they're not on committees. They have the right to vote, but they have to go to trial. I'll remind you that Santos is a critical vote for Kevin McCarthy. He was a critical vote for Kevin McCarthy to get the speakership, and he was a critical vote for Kevin McCarthy to get the budget passed. So this is all about votes. That's why these guys, you know, look the other way on so many things. So uh, we'll talk more about this with John Rothman, but that's the word on that. I know I've got Rothman uh, uh, in a few minutes. I did want to mention the Clarence Thomas mega donor Harlan Crow uh, situation because he has essentially told Congress, hey, I ain't coming to uh, give you a list of details about travel and real estate that I've showered the Thomases with. Forget it. So, um, you know, I played you a little bit. I think Sheldon Whitehouse is magnificent on this stuff. When it comes to dark money and influence in the courts, go to Sheldon Whitehouse. And essentially, the Senate Judiciary Committee wanted Crow, and it was signed by all the Democrats on the committee, including Dianne Feinstein, who is supposedly coming back to work. Um, they want information on gifts and payments given to Clarence Thomas. Well, uh, um, homeboy has basically flipped him the bird, you know, Crow said, yeah, you know, don't stay up waiting for that. Uh, the quote is while the Crows have provided hospitality to the Thomases, that hospitality is rooted in a deep friendship and the Crows derive great satisfaction from spending time with their friends. Personal hospitality is a cherished part of our communal fabric. It is a bought and paid for seat in the high court. And actually, Thomas flipped um, in that Chevron case, and that was no accident. That was a case that Crow had interest in. So, uh, can I give you one last Bay Area story before we... Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. More and more postal carriers are being robbed in the Bay Area. What? Yeah. Uh, U.S. postal inspectors are sharing information around robberies, one in Contra Costa County. It's a disturbing trend seen not only across the country, but also across the Bay Area. Pictures were shared from officials of a suspect accused of robbing a mail carrier in Antioch on May 4th. He stole the postmaster's keys. Those can be used to open mailboxes, of course. And... You know, he had attacked the mail carrier to get this stuff. Mail carrier wasn't injured. Now the U.S. Postal Inspector is offering a $50,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. The carrier is not going to fight for his keys, said the Postal Inspector. The carrier turned over the postal keys and immediately informed the post office and law enforcement. And that is what has brought on this search and this $50,000 reward. Another $50,000 reward was recently announced for San Francisco where a mail carrier was robbed on Folsom Street. That happened in March. So the Bay Area adding these mail carrier robberies to the list of other stuff they're dealing with. And that, my friends, is a taste today of law and disorder. Tune in again next time for more Law and Disorder on The Mark Thompson Show. All right, that's it. Let's roll. Hey. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.